Amen. Amen. Well, what happens to your faith when tragedy strikes? What happens to my faith when circumstances change in your life and one day things are going marvelously and the next day, absolute chaos and tragedy. For, for some people, just out of the blue, a horrific accident happens and the worst case scenario that you could have in your mind actually happens. I was talking to one of my friends in his 60s and he lost a, a toddler to a drowning accident years ago and I just got a chance to pray with him and I was just thinking like, what do you do? What happens to a man, to a woman's soul when you lose a toddler to a drowning accident? What, what, what happens when your bank account or, or everything you worked so hard for so many years and, and, and all of a sudden, it's completely wiped out, and your possessions are gone, stripped. What happens just physically? Like, not, not, maybe not some major disease, but how many just, like, get sick, and you're just bad at being sick? Is there any, like, especially guys. Where are the guys at? Okay, it's funny. I see wives elbowing, like... <laughs> husbands right now. I'll be the first to admit I am the lamest. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm a big, tough guy. Like, give me the flu, and I'm just an absolute, like, I'm, I'm a weenie. I'm a total weenie. <laughs> this week, I, I mean, I'm like in bed, <laughs> like just moping. Anybody? It's like, what, what happens, though, when, when it's some chaotic cancer and, and, and something that you're walking through, I, I've just seen someone, one of my friends this week, actually, he had a tumor in his brain that was as big as one of those protein shakes that you get from Costco in his head that he had to be, had to have removed. And you, and you ask the question, like, okay, when all this kind of chaos happens, when all this tragedy happens, what, do you, what happens to you and your faith? What, what do you do when you interact with God? Do you immediately start blaming God and just throwing him under the bus? Do you ask these crazy questions? Do you, do you, what, what I've found many times, when people are walking through this, this crucible of pain in life, I, I typically see people go one way or the other. It's like there's a, this, this fork in the road. And I see people as painful and as gnarly as it is, they actually grow deeper in their intimacy with God and their faith actually matures to a level that blows my mind. And then tragically, you have some people that they actually take a, a different turn, get mad at God, get bitter, start cursing God, and, and you just know those people, tragically, they just live a life where they're just always on edge, judgmental, no joy, no hope. And it's the most tragic thing in the world. I, I, one of my, how do I say it, like favorite things about being a pastor and least favorite things of being a pastor at the same time is walking with people through tragedy. I'll tell you why. The, the worst is, you're the pastor, you get the call, and the worst accident just happened, and a lady at the church that you serve at just lost her husband and spiritual mentors in an accident, and you're called to go show up to the hospital. Anybody want that job? You want, come, on, come on up and... Brutal. What do you say? There's nothing you can say that will bring the husband back. There's nothing that you can do, and yet that's your job. So on one hand, gut-wrenching and brutal, terrible. But on the other hand, as you walk with, am I, am I saying this, man? As you walk with people that actually are trusting God through the diciest time of their life, you get to see God being real with that person, and your faith grows as a result. Just recently, this was, there was a lady in the church, and I've just seen her, you know, I, I did her dad's funeral, and I just see her walk through chaos. She, she delivered a, a stillborn baby, and we went to do the funeral, and she brings me a gift 
to the, when we go and bury the stillborn baby. A gift that says, it's a sweatshirt that says pray. Like who does that? And I looked at that, I'm like, my faith is shallow. That woman, I want to learn from. See, I think, man, I, this is, maybe I'm just talking about my faith. I think sometimes my faith, if I'm really honest, gets really shallow. And it becomes, bless God, my life's good. Uh, God becomes the genie that gives me the bottle that I can rub and I can have all the wishes I want. And now God will conform to Todd's image and Todd's way of doing things and Todd's will. (laughs) Oh boy, it's right. And and all of a sudden it's like, I am God and God's just some Western world Christianity God that I made up in my mind. But then every now and again, God goes, how about we read the book of Job? And reality starts hitting and goes, you know, holy smokes, what a great picture of how I can grow in this season to worship God in good times and in bad, to submit to his sovereignty when things are going amazing and when things are just absolutely brutal and I lose the closest thing to me and the closest people to me. I I feel like this season in 2023 is gonna be a season of maturing at Love Church. And he starts out by showing us this story. The book of Job, real quickly, a chaotic, heartbreaking story of a man, richest dude around, dude was balling, things were going well. And in one day, that's why I call it the worst day of my life, in one day, he loses everything and all 10 kids. The only thing that's left is like, his wife, which you'll see in the story, probably was like, all right, let's move on to the next one after. You'll see it. Okay, hold on. <laughs> then his friends show up, and for the first week, they did the right thing. You know what they did? They didn't say one word. By the way, real mini message, when people are walking through a chaotic and tough situation, you know what the best thing you can do sometimes is just show up and shut up. It's called the ministry of presence. Don't try to fix anything. Don't try to say, nah, I know how you feel. Nothing, just show up. And they had it right. But then <laughs> after a week, they started to open up their mouth. And you see, like for, for a long time in this book that you're gonna read, I know it's gonna be tedious and it's gonna be challenging, but just read the whole thing. They have this dialogue back and forth. Job, like they start accusing Job. The reason why you lost everything is because you blew it. You had some hidden sin, Job. Oh, thanks, friends. Appreciate that. And they go back and forth for chapters. There's 40, actually 42 chapters in this book. And eventually God shows up. It's so cool. And I can't wait to preach this message. It's called Brace Yourself. Because <laughs> he shows up to Job. He's like, yo, brace yourself like a man. And he starts asking Job these questions. Hey, where were you when um, I created the world and stuff? Where were you? Hey, where were you? Who told the ocean to just to stop right here? And he starts asking all these questions and Job <laughs> humbles himself before God. He's like, man, I, I, was, I, I was talking about stuff I had no idea about God. He repents. And then God does this wild thing at the end of the book. I know I'm spoiling it, but I want you guys to read this. This is crazy. God tells Job, go pray for your knucklehead friends. And when you do, I'm gonna bless you. He goes and prays for, I'd be like, I ain't praying for those friends. Are you kidding me? They're miserable. They made me miserable for, for all this time. He challenged him, go pray for these, these guys. And when he does, do you remember what happens? Those of you study Job? He doubles what Job had in possessions on the, before. It was actually in the prayer, the humble prayer for his friends, that God actually doubled what he had. Powerful, powerful story. Today, let's just try to look at chapter one. You guys ready for this? You're like, happy new year. Why did I come to church? My friend was telling me to come to church and I was like, not on new year's day, I am not going. And then you show up and you're like, awesome, human suffering, Job, this is great. Why are we dealing with this though? Here's here's the reality. Listen, my job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. This is real life. I way prefer Mac to come and just be like, given this amazing positive message. There is some positive in this, by the way, but this is real life. 
and you and I are in real life. So if you're a note taker, let's, let's start with number one. Let's look at Job's prosperity, shall we? Let's look at his prosperity. Let's look what this dude's all about. Job chapter one, starting in verse one. There once was a, na- a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. <laughs> he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. This guy's right on, huh? Verse two, he had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. (laughs) Pause there real quick. Homie was bawling. He was like the Warren Buffett of the, the Far East. Huge you know, it was Robert Kiyosaki with a bunch of rental properties. I mean, the guy was just banging. He had all kinds of passive income. I'm imagining he's a pretty good looking dude. The Bible says he was a man of complete integrity. And my definition of integrity is this. His, his private life matched his public life. This was a guy who was the real deal. And God was honoring and blessing him like crazy, it said that he feared God in the next couple of verses. It said that his 10 kids would actually party a lot. They'd, they'd actually, <laughs> the oldest son would have everybody over to the crib and they would just have this party with last days sometimes. And probably they'd get a little too overboard at times. And the Bible says that, that Job would, would, would sacrifice a burnt offering and pray for his, his kids in case they got out of hand a little bit. By the way, parents, where are my parents with like grown children? They're out of the house. Raise your hand real quick. Pray for your kids. They leave the house and lose their minds at times, okay? So we need to intercede on their behalf. Not my kids that they're in the front row. They're good church kids. No, them as well. So you pray for them and you sacrifice and you intercede. This guy was a man of, he's a man of God. He's rich, he's prosperous, he's balling. And by the way, let me just say this for the Christian church. I don't want you to hear this. When God gives you a prosperous season of life, you should be ashamed or feel bad. Not at all. The Bible says God loves to give good gifts to his children. Nothing at all. The problem is, is when that ends up becoming God, we're in dangerous scenarios and dangerous waters. Prosperous, it's great. There's prosperity, there's integrity. He, he's like the greatest dude around. <laughs> so then verse six, skip down to verse six. One day, the members of the heavenly court, these angels, this group of angels, they came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, underline that in your Bible, the accuser, Satan, came with them. And where have you come from? God asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, well, I've been patrolling the earth watching everything that's going on. Now pause there real quick. Does that just freak you out, by the way, just for a second? That's kind of weird. He's he's floating around earth and... (laughs) I think sometimes we picture Satan like in this red suit, you know, like with horns and a pitchfork in hell. And he's just like, kind of like, ah, I wish I could get, you know. It's not what the Bible talks about. Let me give you a couple additional references 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says this, Satan, who, who is the God of this world. This is a wild thought now. You look at the violence, though, and some of the heinous crimes, some of the evil that's in this world, who's behind it? Could it be hmm, Satan, right? That, sorry, that's church lady, old school, Saturday Night Live. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to throw that in there. <laughs> Come back. Here's another reference, Ephesians 2, 2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air. When you look at social media, just that, and you see the influence of the enemy, it's very clear the enemy is still control of the airwaves of the world. He's setting the course. 
There, I mean, just the amount of fear. Like you turn on the TV and it's like, can we just celebrate something good? No, let's go right to the six o'clock report and how many murders are. It's just satanic all over the place. That's the reality. And that's what he's doing. He's roaming to and fro. First Peter 5, 8 says this, stay alert. Wake up your neighbor, just give him, just say, stay alert, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's the reality, church, I'm sorry. Now, let me give you some good news real quick before you start freaking out. The Bible also says he, uh, he let's see, how does it say it? Greater, thank you, that's what I needed. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. That is good news that we can celebrate. We don't have to be like freaking out. That's why it says, another translation of 1 Peter 5 says, be sober and be vigilant. It doesn't say be scared and be weirded out. Be sober, be understanding, stay alert. But guess what? Greater is he who's in us than he who's in this world. So they're having this, interaction in the heavenlies that when I read about it still is a mystery to me, blows my mind. And in verse eight, the Lord asked Satan, well, now that we're having this conversation, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from evil. So hold on real quick. So they're having this conversation, and God just offers up Job. Well, have you checked him out? Do you want to go ahead and attack him while you're at it? Can you imagine being Job, like reading this scripture, being like, God, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> Things were going great over here. What do you, you point me out for? You ever feel that way? Like, what, why, why, why? Why all of a sudden there's this hedge protection around me, and I feel like, there's this testing and this pruning and this refining of my soul that's actually happening right now that the Lord is permitting. Look at this indictment. Speaking of Satan the accuser, verse nine, Satan says this to, the, to God. Yeah, yeah, I've been studying him. I see him. But Job has a good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. I mean, look at how rich he is. But reach out, look at this accusation, watch this. But reach out and take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Holy smokes. What an accusation. Satan basically is looking God straight in the face and going, the only reason Job actually is following you is because you're actually making him rich. That's the only reason. If you give me the ability to remove all of those belongings, all those possessions, you'll see the real Job and he'll just curse you. He'll leave you. Now, why is this so appropriate and so powerful for us to zone in on? Because how many of us humans... Claim that we fear God, claim that we follow God. Yes, I'm all in, but then something happens circumstantially in our life, and the very first thing we do is actually doubt God and we go away from Him. I think at this point, the enemy actually has a pretty good challenge. Is this faith for real, or is it only based on what God has blessed him with? In other words, why does Job serve God? for who he is or what he gives. I'm like, dude, I, again, I'm the pastor and I'm asking myself when I'm reading this, you know, I'm looking at my friends in India. By the way, did you know that we thought there was two or 300 people that were gonna show up to Christmas Eve in India? There were 900 and, 930 people that showed up to hear the, the gospel message in India. <laughs> Authentic. I look at this guy, Vinay, that just led up this whole thing, and I'm like, dude, that is a Christian right there. That's the dude that I want to be. I'm, he loves Jesus with all his heart. He loves, loves church. He's like, man, we got to get this message out. The only reason Job loves you is because you blessed him. Well, God's like, you're on. Let's go ahead and see what happens here, which blows my mind. There's so much mystery with God, isn't there? 
<laughs> I try to like figure them out and then all of a sudden I read Job and I'm like, well, I'm back to square one. I have no idea what's going on here. Verse 12, he says this, all right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but hold on, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. It's interesting to me, the enemy has to ask for permission to mess with our stuff. And at this point, he says, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna let, let's put this to the test. I'm gonna allow you to take away and mess, you know, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm gonna allow that, but don't touch his person. You can't mess with him physically. And we'll see what happens. Oh my goodness. You remember the uh, place in the scriptures where Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. He wants to sift you like wheat. It's the same thing. Isn't it interesting? He has to ask permission. So, so to me, that, that, may, that gives me a sense of peace. Like the Lord is in control. If he allows the enemy to mess with me at times, it's actually gonna grow me because things are gonna be pruned away in my life and I'm gonna literally see what my faith is really all about. It's scary, I know, but think about that. Think about, man, if I can worship God in every scenario, how freeing that is. How, how firm a foundation that it's not based on what I have, how my bank account's doing, how, how my biceps are doing, how my babe is doing. It's not based on that, it's based on who he is. That is a maturing faith. It's scary to say it, but it is certainly powerful when we hold it. So, Satan unleashes the worst day of Job's life. If you're a note taker, you can jot it down. Number two is adversity. I mean, we're talking, takes away everything he has, including his kids. And we hear this all the time, don't we? Adversity. It's great, I love going through adversity because it strengthens us. I'm looking at you, like going through a knee, like all this kind of stuff, like how horrible, right? You hit these low points, but now you're like, dude, I'm stronger. And because of that, now I'm in this job that I wouldn't have had because I wouldn't have been interested in the pain that I, my knee went through, right? We talk about there's purpose in our pain. But a lot of times we say that, but do we believe it? The, the talk about adversity, <laughs> the absolute worst day of his life, and I can just sum it up, it's actually verse 13 through 19. There's, there's four things that happen. Number one, uh, the oxen and the donkeys get killed and all the farmhands completely wiped out. It would be like a great stock market. You had all your assets in the stocks and they just got, you just go the next day and it's just gone. That's basically, that's the first thing. Uh, number two, a lightning storm destroys the sheep and the shepherds. You know, you hear the insurance companies say it was an act of God. It was actually an act of the enemy that the Lord allowed to happen in this place. So next time your insurance company says that, actually, it's an act of Satan. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> God just permitted it. Okay. No, don't do that. They'll look at you. Ah, you weirdo Christian. So three, the cam 3,000 camels and all the servants get killed. As I was studying this, I was thinking about my, my dad went into business with his furniture making business way back in the day and he had to move to Tampa, Florida and he was working through this and he put a lot of his own resource into it and they were working hard and I don't know, it was a year or two into the business, they were on break, he came back and the guy had actually embezzled all the money that was left in the business and took off to a foreign country. That's the kind of thing that's happening right here. The camel's completely gone, the servants. And the worst thing of all, number four, this great tornado hits, or this cyclone hits, and it says that all of his kids, all 10 of his kids are having this party. This, this, this huge wind comes and, and knocks the house down, killing all of the kids in it. Can you imagine? I mean, how horrific I was telling you about my friend who lost their toddler to a drowning accident. One of my other friends is a pastor. He lost their young daughter a few years ago to an asthma attack, and he was trying to save her when she died. I mean, you talk about gut-wrenching. 
the chaos, the confusion, the absolute meltdown that would happen in this, this day, the worst day that he could even possibly dream of. The question, as I'm reading this though, what would his response be? Remember my first question I asked you? What, is, what happens to your faith, what happens to my faith when we walk through some of the most chaotic situations, loss, like unexplainable things and accidents that happen, what happens to our relationship with God? I wanna look at this next verse because this verse changed my life, literally. Because as a pastor, I deal with this all the time. What do you, what do you say? What do you do? What sh- how should I react? What should I do when, when chaos strikes, when tragedy strikes? If you're ready, this is the verse that I learned, and I hope it helps you. Verse 20, Job stood up. He tore his robe in what? In what church? What does it say? In grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. This, this, this absolutely changed my life. Did you, did you see it? He first absolutely is overcome and weeps. He falls to the ground, but then what does he do? He worships. He weeps and he worships. There, there's a, a Christian artist named Jeremy Camp who tells the story of his first wife who lost a battle to cancer and in the hospital room as she passed, he had this exact experience. He was just undone. He was, he was weeping uncontrollably and he felt God speak to him in the moment as he was on his face in tears saying, okay, now get up and worship. Now, you, huh. what? Say again now. He's on his face, weeping, overcome. Somehow God gives him a special grace to actually get to his feet and begins worshiping God right after he lost his wife. What was that? That was weeping and worshiping. It was weeping and it was worshiping. Many times what I've seen is people are one-sided after this type of loss and, and, and chaos. What do I mean by that? I've seen a ton of weeping, no worshiping. A ton of mourning, no moving. Grieving, but no glorifying. What ends up happening is tragically these people, I've seen it over time, they get so depressed and so overwhelmed and so hard and so bitter and so mad at God, they end up losing years of their life. Imbalanced. Then, then I see the opposite sometimes. Well, I'm a Christian, so nothing affects me. So all I'm gonna do is worship. I'm not gonna weep. All I'm gonna do is glorify God. I'm not gonna give my, my season of grieving some time. All I'm, well, God's good. He's always good. He's always good. And, and, and we just deny it. And, and dude, I got bills to pay. I got things to do. I'm just gonna move. I'm not gonna mourn. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep on moving. That's equally, <laughs> completely unhealthy. Here's what I've seen at work. Not perfect, and it never is, and it's never fun, and you can hate it, but there, here's, here's how over time, it's weep, it's worship. It's grieve, it's glorify. It's mourn, it's move. It's both. And it's this process that happens. And man, I'm telling you, I saw it firsthand in, in the, the toughest thing I've ever dealt with when it comes to pastoral ministry. And one of our good friends, young couple on fire for God in the church, they were going for it. I had just met with the husband that week. We, were at, we had a lunch over at the, the Thai place over there, Mike. I think you were with me, and we were, we were meeting, and we were praying through. He was, he was seeing victory in his life, and it was really cool. He's like, yeah, man, we're going on this marriage retreat with Ty and Terry, who are some of their mentors, and it's going to be amazing. 
And then the worst case scenario that you could ever dream happen, they get in this car accident, all of them die except for Emily. Somehow, miraculously, she survives. And we go up to visit her at this hospital in South Dakota, and you could hardly recognize her. It's just an absolute miracle that she was alive. God still had some plans for her on this planet. And it was wild just to go and to pray. We're praying for family and that kind of stuff. And, and then we come back home, and it was a couple weeks later, she was getting out of the hospital, and we wanted to go up and pray as she was being released. And can you just imagine, by the way, here you are, a young woman of God, just lost your husband, your health, you don't know what's gonna happen. And I'm walking into this scenario, and, and I'm the pastor, this, I'm like, what do, I, I got nothing. What do, you, what, do you, what do you give? And I remember as we're, as we're driving up to that, God speaks Job 120 into my heart. And I walk in with this scripture and I said, Emily, I don't have really any answers other than this. This is the only thing that I can give you. It's gonna be a balance of weeping and worshiping. It's gonna be a balance of grieving and glorifying. It's gonna be a balance of mourning and moving. And I don't know how it's all gonna look, but listen, man, I, I, whatever that means to you, and you could just, man, as you just see the years go by and, and you see this woman work through this process back and forth and you see God get glory after glory after glory through this chaotic situation. Some of you are like, dude, why did you tell me that? I'm good. Can I just tell you, you might have a day just like Job in your future and I'm trying to prepare you now. I've seen too many people, man. It's just, it, it literally sends people into, and they lose their life because of it. It's a balance. It's back and forth, back and forth, weeping, worshiping. You can jot it in your notes. It's really this idea of God's sovereignty. It's submitting to his sovereignty. You're like, awesome. I'm so glad I came on, on New Year's Day. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to be a good pastor and tell you this is true. This is real life. This is powerful, this response. The sovereignty of God, he deals with it. Look, look what he says in the very next verse. It'll blow your mind. He says, he said, tell you what, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, which I put in my Bible, the Lord has allowed. It wasn't him, it was the enemy that killed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. How about that? You wanna talk about maturing faith. You wanna talk about steady in every storm. It's submitting to God's sovereignty. He basically says, naked I came, naked I'm gonna go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He, he, he gave all that I have, he's taken it away. What a position of open hand living, of full trust and submitting to the sovereignty. I, the last you know, few months ago, I mentioned to you guys, my grandpa passed away. He was my closest grandparent. And a guy that I just had so much respect for, uh, hardworking, generous, uh, my, my grandma, I mean, <laughs> just amazing people, you know, from the farm in Iowa. And my grandpa, he, he grew up poor. He was, I think he was four when he got adopted. Didn't have anything. And he grew up, just started working hard, and God just starts blessing him. And <laughs> he was one of the first ones to develop uh, microwave popcorn as a farmer. How about that? How random. And some wild thing, it grows up with nothing, and all of a sudden, God just blesses him in an amazing way. And, and he recognized it was the hand of God, and you know what he did? It was the hand of God, and so he opened up his hand, and my grandpa and grandma were the most generous people I've ever been around. And I, I remember going to their visit, his visitation, the day before I spoke at his, at his funeral, and I just had this moment at the open casket, and I'm like, that, that is... Absolutely true. There's my grandpa right there. He, he, didn't, he came into this world with nothing. He's leaving with nothing. And the process, though, he, he trusted God with an open hand. And he said, you know what, God, whatever you've given me, I'm gonna give away. What a, what a way 
to live your life submitting to God's sovereignty. I don't have enough time to tell you about chapter two. Let me just try to give you a briefly, a brief synopsis. I'll tell you one last story and then I'll let you go for your New Year's Day brunch. Um, it's wild because Job's response, submitting to God's sovereignty, trusting him, even through the worst day of his life, Satan comes back and was like, hey, bro, like, if you let me touch his person now, physically, then he'll surely curse you. Skin for skin, a man will do whatever he needs to do to save his life, the law of self-preservation. So God is like, all right. You can touch his body, you can't kill him. And he breaks out in this, like, these wild boils, these like painful boils, like from head to toe. And he's taking like this broken piece of like a pot. He's like scraping himself. I mean, it was just gnarly. It says in Job 7, 5, that his body was covered with maggots and scabs. His skin breaks open, oozing with pus. That's gross. Like that's what he, and and a lot of scholars submit, it was, it's, the condition was called psychosomatic dermatitis. Ugh. And his wife looks at him and is like, what are you doing? You still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. You know what he says to her? Last verse, Job 2.10, Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. (laughs) And listen to this guy. He says, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. How about that? You want to talk submitting to the sovereignty of God. I'll accept good, but also accept bad. What a powerful position to be in as a Christian. Immovable. It's painful. I don't like it. I hate it. But God, I'm going to, I'm going to grieve, but I'm also going to glorify. I'm going to trust you through the process. I'll, I'll share this last story. This has been one of the latest in the church that's really helped me grow as a Christian. There's a very mature couple in our, our church, Dave and, and Bonnie, and they've been very public, actually, with their, their process. They, have a, they had a grandchild who lost a battle to cancer and prayed for him for years, and, and, and it's just gut-wrenching to see the process of, you know, you have questions like, God, what's, what's happening here? And I remember Mike and I saw Dave out in the parking lot not, not, not too long ago when he was right there battling for his life and we were praying for him and I just looked at him and, and I would just say thank you guys for your example because they, they, they stayed strong and they prayed for a miracle but they said, God, whatever you do, we trust you. And, and Dave's telling us, wasn't he Mike? He was telling us like this story in, in the book of Daniel. I think it's chapter three, you remember where the, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this gold statue and has everybody bow down. And, and you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like, no way, we're not gonna do it. And the king starts freaking out. And they looked at the king and they said, you know what? You can throw us in that fire. God, we believe he's, he can save us from that fire. But even if he doesn't, we're still gonna worship God. And Dave's preaching this message to me. He's saying, you know what? We're praying. We believe God can heal him. If he doesn't, we're still going to worship God. You talk about a powerful position of sub- submitting to God's sovereignty. That, that will keep you steady in any circumstance that you and I deal with. We worship him when things are up. We worship him when things are down. He is to be glorified for who he is, not what he gives. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Such a strong word here in 2023. We pray for a maturing church. Forgive me, God, at times where I can look at you like a genie, God. Forgive me, God. I want to look at you for who you are, a sovereign God who knows things I have no clue about. You are on the throne And we submit to you, God, here today. I pray for all my friends that are working through the toughest season of their life. Would you be with them in this season?
touch their hearts, do what only you can do, supernatural comfort from heaven for your people. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna conclude with an opportunity of response, and it's gonna be a little bit different today. I was, um, I was studying the scripture in Isaiah. Uh, it was Isaiah 61 and one. Actually, it, this scene was actually in The Chosen as well, if you're, if you're watching this, and it's a, it's a scene when Jesus gets invited to read the scriptures at the Jewish synagogue, and it was a traveling rabbi, he takes the scroll, and it happens to be the scroll from Isaiah 61.1, and it says this, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And this is what hit me, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So I just wanna, I, I wanna pray for you here. There's two, two major prayers as we begin 2023. Here, here's the first one, is that the spirit of the Lord would be upon us and we'd be preaching the gospel, the good news in this dark world all around. Businesses and schools and gyms, India, Africa, Florida, D.C., wherever we're at, we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. What's the good news? The good news is, that we have a God who left heaven, came to this planet, lived the perfect life that we couldn't, died the death in our place, paying for the sin of all mankind, was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the grave. Now he sends his spirit. He's just reaching out to have a relationship with his people. We share that message. We share with our words, with our actions, with our hearts, and we'll see continued revival. Hundreds of people getting saved. Hundreds of people being baptized. It's happening all over this city, all over around the world. I wanna pray for that for you. All of us, little missionaries, man, out in our community. And then number two, for the brokenhearted. A special anointing over your heart in this season. You're working through something. I'm not sure what it is. God wants to continue to minister to you. Again, it's a process. It's not you snap your fingers and you move on. It's a process. So let's stand together. And I wanna just conclude with those, those two prayers. We'll have Jordan come wrap us up and we'll let you go. Anybody specifically you say, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna share the gospel more boldly, more humbly, more tactfully in this, this new year. Can you, just, can you just wave at me just real quick? I think that's my heart. Thank you. Lord, all of us, help equip us. We, we, we desire to be bold, but we don't wanna be weird. We, we pray that we be tactful and humble and accurate in sharing your truth, helping people connect with you. That's our heart. Not religion, not religiosity, but true relationship. Help us cultivate these relationships and connect people with you. I know it's you that does it, but we're just asking you humbly that you would allow us the privilege of partnering with you. In 2023, we pray for revival. Many people living in darkness would come to the light. In Jesus' name. If you really are working through something, you have been working through something in your heart, some type of loss, maybe a questioning of God, tough circumstances, can you wave at me real quick? I wanna pray for you as well. I'm still trying to figure out all kinds of stuff I see over there. You can receive this online as well. Lord, we pray for, for the brokenhearted right now. We pray just for a peace, an embrace. Sometimes we don't need an answer. We need an embrace. Do you touch your people afresh? Maybe we'll never know why but maybe we're gonna know who deeper in this season. Maybe, I pray against any mental confusion. I pray you bring clarity. Where there is unrest and sleeplessness, we pray, God, just for a peace and a deep, a deep, deep sleep 
rejuvenate hearts and minds. Bring us back to a full trust in you, our sovereign creator in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Happy 2023. Give it up for Jordan as he